Well, good morning. This week we go into Matthew chapter 18. Just as a reminder, in chapter 17 we read about the transfiguration and following that, the healing of a demoniac and the trouble that it gave the disciples. And then we ended on the temple tax or the atonement tax. This week we start with, despite them having seen Jesus' glory, in the Transfiguration, a discussion on their own personal glory. I'll be starting in chapter 18 with verse 1 through verse 20. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and said, Who then is greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And he called the child to himself and set him before them, and said, Truly I say to you, unless you are converted and become like children, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever then humbles himself as this child... He is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble, it would be better for him to have a heavy millstone hung around his neck and to be drowned in the depth of the sea. Woe to the world because of its stumbling blocks, for it is inevitable that stumbling blocks come. But woe to that man through whom the stumbling block comes. If your hand or your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it from you. It is better for you to enter life crippled or lame than to have two hands or two feet and be cast into the eternal fire. If your eye causes you to stumble, pluck it out and throw it from you. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than to have two eyes and be cast into the fiery hell. See that you do not despise one of these little ones, for I say to you, that their angels in heaven continually see the face of my Father who is in heaven. For the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. What do you think? If any man has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the ninety-nine on the mountains and go and search for the one that is straying? If it turns out that he finds it, truly I say to you, he rejoices over it more than over the ninety-nine which have not gone astray." So it is not the will of your Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones perish. If your brother sins, go and show him his fault in private. If he listens to you, you have won your brother. But if he does not listen to you, take one or two more with you, so that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every fact may be confirmed. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church, and if he refuses to listen even to the church, Let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again I say to you, that if two of you agree on earth about anything that they may ask, it shall be done for them by my Father who is in heaven. For where two or three have gathered together in my name, I am there in their midst. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I, I thank you as I, as I perpetually do throughout the week that we have this church and this pastor, Lord, and what a privilege it is to be a member and to hear this preaching, Lord. I ask that you be with us as a congregation throughout this building and uh, throughout Bonaire and throughout the U.S. As, as those may listen and be with Kenny as he preaches your word, Lord. And I ask that as, uh, as we gather here, that, that we pray for growth and for unity in our body, Lord. And we pray these things in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. Good morning. Since Christmas, we've been back here on Saturday afternoons recording the message for the, the next day. Next week, God willing, we're going to go to live streaming and we have everything we think in place now to do that. It takes an awful lot. I didn't know. But it takes an awful lot to do this and to do it right. And uh, we hope to start with a very uh, good uh, product, you might say, next Sunday. And it's gonna be, we're going to be streaming live the 1030 service. So this will be a new time for those of you who are watching on, online. And it will be streaming. And so look for more information on that. Uh, today's text, as Eric has read for us, is in Matthew chapter 18. Matthew 18, 1 begins a new section. It's the fourth section called the fourth discourse. It goes through chapter 19, verse 2. 
and you can always tell the, the beginning and the end, the way it's couched. He says, at that time, the disciples came to Jesus. So there's a transition of time. And then in chapter uh, 19, verse 2, and large crowds followed him, and he healed them there. And that's the end of that section. And what we're going to be looking at this morning as we look at verses 1 through 20, there's actually two major sections in this. Uh, the one that we'll be looking at this morning, and then the extended teaching on the relationships, which is forgiveness, which he teaches from chapter 21, I'm sorry, from verse 21 through verse 20 or, or 35. And uh, we preached on this text, verse 21 through verse 35, earlier in the year, uh, I should say in 2020. And so next week we're going to take up with chapter 19 uh, when we start back next week. So I just wanted to give you those uh, thoughts. Now, the, the issue in this text is relationships in the kingdom. And we're going to look at four different sections in, this, uh, in the first 20 verses. And the first is an example of humility, and it runs in verses 1 through 4. I like what Eric said in the introduction, how that the disciples now have come down, three of them, from the Mount of Transfiguration, and immediately they start talking about their glory. Uh, who's going to be the greatest among them? And Jesus uh, knows this question. He hears this question. You can only imagine what it must have done to him as far as disappointment and uh, so on with the disciples. Uh, in the other two accounts of this, in uh, Mark's gospel, uh, chapter, uh, I believe it's chapter 9, and then in Luke, I want to look this up and make sure, uh, I think it's, it's, it's Mark 9. I know it's Mark 9, and that's the important one. So you might want to look at that one later on. But again, the question is, who is the greatest? Now, Jesus had mentioned distinctions among disciples in chapter 5, verse 19, and then again in chapter 6, verses 9 through 13 in the Sermon on the Mount. And also, and I think this was mentioned last week in the in the discussion that you can imagine that three of these disciples have just been highly favored to go up onto the Mount of Transfiguration. Now, the question was, why these three? I, I believe it was mainly because it goes back to the Exodus account where Moses took three witnesses with him. And the three witnesses were, of course, the inner core of Peter, James, and John. And this might have been part of the uh, reason or the occasion for the disciples arguing about who is the greatest. And this is going to plague them, oddly enough, right up until the time of the cross. Because we're going to see it again in chapter 20, verses 20 through 24. And we know that this question, uh, who is the greatest, is not who we are in Christ. It's not part of our spiritual DNA, but it's the flesh that asks the question, who is the greatest? Because that's not the right question. Jesus then answers the question with this, what is the most important? He doesn't even talk to them about who is the greatest. He says, okay, let's look at this. And so he calls a child over And it must have been a surprise to everyone when he calls this little child, and especially to the child. Children weren't used to being called into the, into the circle of adults uh, talking in those days in the ancient Near East. And he says about the child, he says, unless you are converted, this is in verse 3, and the word here for convert is strephomai, and it points to the radical nature in the change of a believer's heart. Now, Often we think that Jesus called the little child because, you know, children are innocent and children are so sweet and, you know, they have such great faith and all of these things. Anybody who says that, I wonder if they've ever been around children. I've been around children. I was a child. And children are not innocent. And children are many times not nice. And children, I don't think, have changed in thousands of years as far as who they are, basically. So this is not, Jesus doesn't call the child over to point to the child's you know, innocence or 
or their childlike faith or anything like that. He calls the child over because children in the Middle East, in that ancient Near Eastern culture, were of little importance. They were subject to the authorities of the elder, or to the authority of the elders, and they were not taken seriously except as a responsibility. So a, a child was someone that was a child, and you, and you helped them, and you gave them guidance, but you didn't take instruction from them. That's why that when Jesus went to the temple, it was such a remarkable exception. Jesus, at 12 years old, is teaching the elders, but not here. The only important thing about these kids was their potential and the responsibility that the community had and the elders had and their parents had to raise them up to be responsible adults in the community. As R.T. France said, they were to be looked after, not looked up to. I've said before that children are, are wonderful and, and, and children, you know, they, they need our attention, they need our guidance and all these things and and, and that's great, but children make poor gods. And we can't substitute and live through children. Children are to receive our attention and receive our guidance and our wisdom. So to be great in the kingdom requires a total reorientation. To go from the rat race of trying to get ahead and be the greatest to being insignificant. D.A. Carson said that Jesus here advocates humility of mind, not childish thought. As children dependent on their elders, so we must depend upon God. And that's the lesson here. Children are humble in, in this sense, not so much with each other, but in the sense that they are recipients. They have to have their needs met from their elders. And so they must obey their elders and follow their elders. That's the humility of mind here that Jesus is speaking of. So we must listen to him and we must listen to our heavenly father and we must follow him and look to him and not ourselves. And the second thing that he talks about here is the danger of the stumbling block. That's in verses 5 through 11. So Jesus now, he changes here from such a child in verse 5 to the little ones in verse 6. Now, this is a subtle change, but really there, there's a major shift here because now he's not talking about this child in his midst. He's talking about believers. And don't you like what he calls believers? He calls us the little ones. The little ones refer to the followers of Jesus who come in his name. And to reject them and to harm them is to harm and reject Jesus. Remember Paul, uh, as he was at that time, Saul of Tarsus on the road to Damascus back in Acts chapter 9. And when Jesus confronts him and he's, he's knocked down in the road, Jesus says to Saul, why do you persecute me? Not the church. He says to persecute the church, to persecute the little one, Saul, is to persecute me. This is a warning to unbelievers with gray promise of judgment in the eschatological future. That is, in the future judgment of Jesus Christ. To entice the little ones is to even give a greater offense. And so they're to be careful not to be a stumbling block. I can imagine what a warning this was, even though it was unheeded to the scribes and Pharisees of that day. And he says to these scribes and Pharisees, if your foot, offend, if, if your foot offends you, cut it off. If, you, if your hand offends you, cut it off. If your eye offends you, pluck it out, because better to lose your, your eye or your hand or your foot than to have the judgment of Christ at the end and to be cast into the fiery hell. And so the first warning here is woe to the world. But then there's another warning that begins in verse, two, in verse 10. See that you do not despise one of these little ones. The emphasis now shifts from the world to disciples, to us as believers. Believers. 
We must not allow pride or competition to lure us into offending other believers. My beloved, that's important because as a, as a believer, that little one is who they are in Christ because of what Christ has done for them. For what God has done, for God has shed his great grace and love upon them, has lavished upon that person. And for me to offend that person, to despise that person, is a, is a grave offense for me. And so Jesus warns not to offend or not to despise our fellow disciples. He says something here very interesting in verse 10. For I say to you that, the, that their angels in heaven continually see the face of my Father who is in heaven. And I'm going to take just a moment for this because it's such an interesting verse. Maybe we'll talk about it in the panel tonight. But the angel here is interpreted in, ver- in various ways. Even amongst the, the writers that I was reading preparing for this message, some think it refers to guardian angels here. That, that every believer has a guardian angel at once. That angel uh, sees the, the unveiled face of God and at the same time uh, looks over us. That's one interpretation. Another interpretation is that there are representative angels. Like the angels to the churches perhaps. If that, that's one uh, translation of that. Although I believe the angels to the churches happen to be the pastors. D.A. Carson has another explanation. I, th- I think I like this one the best, although I would not rule out the others. But he says the angels represent the, that aspect of our soul and spirit that lives forever in God's presence. So for me to despise a fellow believer is to forget that that person will one day be in the presence of God with the unveiled glory of God emanating and shining upon them and they will be glorying in his glory along with me. And so I should never despise the little ones because of their relationship and because of their future with Christ. Then he shifts to a third story and that is in verse 12, the 99 plus 1. Now, here is a parable with two applications. This parable is told in Luke chapter 15, verses 3 through 7. It's told to the Jewish leaders to explain why Jesus fellowships with sinners. Because he wants to bring the one sinner home. But I think the the story could have been told again. And this time, the text is directed to the disciples to explain to them the Father's care For the little ones. And so in this context, again, we we learn that we should never despise the little ones, but we should do everything we can to keep them safely in the fold. You know, as as pastors and elders of Bonner First Baptist Church and as the deacons of this church, our responsibility is to look after families. It's a very troubling thing when when, when, when you think there's a family that's put out in some way as far as uh, maybe they've gotten their feelings hurt or, and, and sometimes legitimately. And so it's our responsibility to, to go out and do all that we can to help the little ones because we're all little ones. That we might continue to vouch for their salvation. That we might continue to help them grow in their relationship to Christ, to enjoy the presence and the benefits of being in the community of Christ. Uh, oh, it's, it's a terrible thing when, when, when you lose one. Yeah, the 99 are here, but the one is gone. And so as pastors and, and deacons and elders, we are striving to go after the one. To make sure that all are here and that none are lost. And that's what Jesus is saying here. The love of one sheep is not at the expense of the 99. You don't forget about the 99 to go after the one. But even as you love the 99, we all care 
for the one because we all love and desire the preservation of the whole flock. That's another thing that I delight in when I hear Eric pray as he prays for our flock here at Bonaire. And then finally, the fourth thing here is if your brother sins. So this parable of the 99 actually leads us right into the next section. Uh, People leave fellowships for different reasons. Sometimes they get their feelings hurt or sometimes there's something legitimate. It can be something with a pastor or somebody in the church. But sometimes it's, it's, it's a, a world distraction. Sometimes it might be some sin that, that entices someone or, or puts someone in such a fix that when they come to church, they can't pray and they can't worship without being bothered by it. And then they don't want to, to be brought into what the church teaches about that. There are all kinds of reasons, but but here in this particular reason, the the reason is there's been an offense. Some legitimate offense that a brother has or a sister has against someone else, and it's happened in private. But it has public ramifications. And so Jesus says, if your brother sins... now. Again, that would be legitimate. Let's, let's be sure that we just hadn't got our feelings hurt over something per, that we took personal that we shouldn't have or, or something like that. But to be sure that when there's a problem, a perceived problem, that we go to our brother or our sister in private here, one-on-one, and just say, hey, uh, I... I I have, I, I've received a, a hurt or an offense, and I want to make sure that, first of all, that it was not intentional, and if it was, then I'd like for us to work this out. And you can do that without being offensive yourself, and you can do it without being confrontational. That's very important. If you don't know how to do that, then uh, call me, and I'll put you onto some stuff, maybe let you talk to Dan Darden and uh, help you to, to work things out in a way that's not confrontational. We don't need confrontation when we have problems with each other. This is not politics. This is church. But then if if this doesn't solve it, then what you do is you get some witnesses. So there's a uh, three-step process here, private confrontation, and then two or three witnesses. This goes back to Deuteronomy chapter 19 and verse 15. Now, it's not clear here if these are or eyewitnesses, or if they're some kind of arbitrators or judges. But whatever the case may be, they, they go and they listen to both sides, and then they help work it out. Well, what a delightful thing when you have people in the church who have knowledge and wisdom and who most of all care to, to sit down with two people and, and say, let's work this out. To be honest with you, I've never seen when somebody would do this correctly, I've never seen this fail. But if it does fail, then you take it to the church. Now, of course, this would rise to the occasion that something has happened, that this brother or sister has done something to the the point and to the extent, to the degree that church discipline is required, whatever that discipline may be. In in, in this case, it seems to be uh, an extreme uh, judgment because it is to treat them as a Gentile or a tax collector, that is, is putting them outside the community. Very grave offense. But if a church cannot have that kind of discipline, then it really ceases to be a church. Now, the person must be found in a legitimate fault. The person must refuse to be reconciled. And then they are treated as if they do not belong to the community. Then he goes on to say in verse 18, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Now, I like what R.T. France says about this. He says the fact that God has given his people the role of declaring his will on earth 
does not mean that he is bound that he is bound to add his divine sanction to anything they make up. <laughs> what a great statement. We're not free in the church to to go outside the bounds of God's word and that would certainly include uh, being gracious and merciful. As far as uh, this matter of Christian ethics. So it's very important that, that it be done in the right spirit, that it be done the right way. But it's very important that it be done. You know, I see this more and more, and I was, I was very disturbed to, to hear about a church in our own state. No, no, it was in Nashville where uh, this young man is a pastor there, and he's, he's adopted this view that uh, the word of God is not authoritative in their church because it can't be trusted to judge in modern society. Well, beloved, don't you understand when you lose authority and you lose your conviction of the word, then you're not going to last very long. A liberal religion has been tried many, many times, just like what he's trying. They've said the same things he's saying, and in a few years... They disappear because there's no conviction in the community. is not genuine. It's not founded on anything solid. The church must be founded on the word of God. We must abide by the word of God. And then Jesus goes on to give this promise. And I want to tell you something. This is really important because you see that Jesus shifts this to the one that he, he is the one who's judging here. He says, it shall be done for them by my Father who is in heaven, for where two or three have gathered in my name. Jesus here now is the ultimate judge. He says, if two of you agree on earth about anything that they may ask. Now, this is about, this is the context of the two or three witnesses. It's not about asking anything, two people getting together and saying, you know what, we would like a hundred acres with oil on it and a truck coming down the road with an oil rig. And so we're going to pray about this and we're going to gather together and Jesus is bound to be with us because he said he would be and we're going to get anything we ask. That's not what he's talking about here. He's talking about discipline. He's talking about relationships in the church. And he says, as you are working on this relationship in the church, I will be with you. What a comforting promise that is, that as we work through all of our imperfections as human beings, even though we're saved, we have a new nature, and that new nature has to contend with this coil of flesh that we live in. And yet, as we work through these things, Jesus says, I will be in your midst. To work them out. What a great promise. That's a promise we never think about in the church. That Jesus is here. Not to give us trifling things. But Jesus is here. To help us. To maintain unity. In our relationships. With each other. So as we close this message. Let's think about a couple of things. First of all. The Christian life. And the guidance of the church is to be lived and practiced under the radical humility which is counter to the world's thoughts. The world says what is most important is me and what I want. Jesus says what is most important is the Father's will and the one another community. Secondly, in the kingdom, relationships are vital, and we must do all that we can to protect them both both vertically and horizontally. So we must pray about relationships, be sure that we always come at things ready to forgive, ready to receive forgiveness, ready to give mercy, ready to receive grace, as we have from our Heavenly Father. Don't you love what Paul says? I want to read you this, and then I'll close this message as we, as we come to the end. It's in Ephesians, in chapter 4 of Ephesians. And I, I read this verse often, but it's one of my favorite verses in the Bible. Uh, and so I want to read this to you. 
and not Galatians, but Ephesians. I knew that didn't say the right thing. He says, the last two verses, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with malice. Be kind-hearted to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving each other, just as God and Christ has forgiven us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this message, for this text that shows us the importance of having well, this countercultural mentality that who we are and who's the greatest is not the most important, but what we are in your kingdom, that we are the objects of mercy and grace, and that without you we'd be nothing. And so we live in that light. And we live in light that we are a one another community. Lord, putting each other and each other's interests ahead of the others, ahead of ourselves. That we might contribute to the building up of your body. And I pray for this body at Bonner First Baptist, just as Eric prayed this morning. I pray that you would bless us to keep the unity that you've given to us. And to watch after all the little ones that are here in Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.